So the final speaker of today's program is Andreas Karch from University of Texas at Austin, and the title is A Top-Down Dictionary for Double Holography. Please start. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be invited to speak at this conference, especially I'm, I'm amazed that some people are willing to be up till midnight to listen to my talk. But uh, thank you very much for that. I want to talk to you about um, some work with Christoph Ullemann and how you sound today. And uh, we are trying to derive a proper dictionary for double holography. To begin with, I need to kind of quickly talk about what double holography is. Maybe I don't need to talk about it. Most people have heard about this by now. In case you want to hear more about this story, I gave a detailed review of this at Strings. But let me just give you like a very quick summary of um, what is the after. Right? So this is all about a story about Wendel Sandton brains. And Wendel Sandton brains are a solution to Einstein's equations where the only matter they're adding is a very thin sheet, an infinitesimal sheet that you know, whose action is based in only a tension term. It wants to minimize its world volume area. Depending on the value of the tension, you know, the induced metric on the world volume can end up having a negative, a zero, or net positive cosmological constant. And, then these values I would refer to as the subcritical tension, the critical tension, and the supercritical tension. Away from the brain, you know, the geometry is just ADS. So you end up gluing together portions of ADS if you solve Einstein's equations. And one interesting thing about these random sundown brains that will feature very prominently in all of this is you study linearized fluctuations around the solution. They exhibit a trapped graviton on the brain. The graviton is massive in the subcritical case and is massless on the Here are some examples of how this looks like. So in the middle, I have the critical brain that was the one originally discussed by Wendel and Sandrum, uh, where the purple region is what I'm excising from space-time and the white is what I'm keeping. Then the right-hand side of the sitter brain is the supercritical one and the left, that's the subcritical one. And just one more instruction of how to read these pictures. So the full solution is like two copies of the white space-time, the not shaded space-time glued together across the brain. Um, Often we are only interested in some sort of, right, not in this whole double space time. So you can do an orbifold projection. There's a C2 symmetry that identifies the two you know, copies of parts of ADS that you keep with each other. If you orbifold by this, the space time that you end up with is only this wide region. So you, you started with a big ADS space time. You solve the embedding equation for this brain, which is the Israel equation, that's you know, Einstein's equation, the presence of a delta function source. And then that equation instructs you of what part of space time to keep and what part of space time to solve it. It's often more illustrative to draw this in the Poincare patch. So we zoom in in this like purple box where the boundary is not a sphere but just flat space. Then you get a standard you know, Poincare patch representation of ADS where the black line on top is the boundary. ADS space kind of has one radial direction that goes down. And you're removing the piece of space time near the boundary. The UV part of space time is removed. The IR of space, IR part of space time is kept. And again, if you study fluctuations, you find that on top of 5D gravity, what this brain will induce is a trapped 4D graviton on the brain. This gives an interesting idea of how holography should work in this context. And this is in the end what I want to spend most of my time talking about. So, so you look at this, and from the bulk point of view, what you have is either two in the full setting or one in this orbifolded setting, which I want to talk about mostly today one copy of the infrared part of ADS-5. And on top of this, you have this trapped graviton on this V plus one dimensional brain. If you try to read this from the point of holography, you know ADS-5 is dual to 4D CFT. We cut out the UV part, so we apparently put some sort of UV cutoff on the CFT. But that alone wouldn't explain where this trapped 4D graviton comes from. So the data that has been put forward like late in the 90s was it the correct dual description for one of these random syndrome setups? You have to add back in this dynamical graviton by hand on the dual side. The correct holographic description for one of these random syndrome space times would be a 4D CFT with a UV cutoff coupled to dynamical gravity. So gravity is on both sides. 5D gravity is dual to 4D gravity coupled to a CFT. The CFT is sort of dual to the fifth dimension, but both sides have dynamical 4D gravity. This sounds like a very strange holographic picture, and to some extent, today's talk is all going to be about how can we make this more visible. If you do the same for the subcritical brain, you end up with an even more interesting story. You found that it find in that case, you, you're naturally led to the idea that the setup doesn't just have two dual descriptions, this like you know, 4D CFT plus gravity and the 5D bulk, but in fact, there are three equivalent pictures that all describe the physics of the system. 
Let me explain this in a little bit more detail. Right, so the special thing about the subcritical brain is that it actually intersects the boundary. So it removes half of the original boundary, but keeps half of the original boundary. So if you look at this from the same point of view of standard random syndrome holography, you'd be saying, well, I have you know, a CFT that living on two copies of half space. You can think of those as being two half Minkowski spaces. But at least when you couple to gravity, it's much more useful to kind of think of the space time on the blue brain as being ADS4. Right. And when I have a CFD, whether it's half of Minkowski space or ADS, that's all the same thing. They're conformally related. But once I couple the gravity, there's actually a difference. And the you know, correct answer is that on this brain, you have an ADS4 living here. So on this blue brain, you have ADS4 living. That brain removed some part of space time. Again, the part near the boundary. So there seems to be a 40 CFD uh, with a UV cutoff. You again find a trapped graviton. So it's a 40 CFD coupled to 40 gravity living on this ADS4 brain. And on top of this, I have the original CFD also living over on the other half of the original boundary. So I seem to be ending up with this 40 CFD plus gravity on the brain communicating via this joint boundary with a CFD without gravity over living on half space. And you no know, modern parlance for this is, would be like ADS4 gravity coupled to a BAS, where the BAS is some sort of non gravitating CFD on half space. Now we can take one more step kind of say, well, this blue brain, that's a 40 C of gravity on ADS4. I can use holography on this one as well and dualize this 40 gravity theory to a 3D CFD um, living on the boundary of the 40 CFD on half space. So there seems to be a dual description which doesn't involve any gravity at all. And that's just a B CFD, a CFD or a 40 CFD living on half space coupled to some complicated 3D CFD. That's sort of some sort of boundary condition for the 40 CFD. The BCFD description is, of course, like the you know, perfectly well defined. That's sort of ultimately the one that makes you no know, total sense. That's just more or less standard holography. But the interesting one is the one in the middle where you have this picture of 40 gravity on the brain coupled to the 40 bars in half space. And it's very easy to understand how one goes from like these two dual descriptions to each other if they were both make sense. And basically, what the difference between two and three is that from the BCFD point of view, what you're doing. You're dualizing using holography only the 3D degrees of freedom that are living on the boundary, but you leave the 40 degrees of freedom of the BCFD untouched. So you have this 40 BCFD coupled to a 3D CFD at the boundary, and you can either use holography on the whole thing, in which case you get this five dimensional bulk, or you use holography only on the 3 degrees of freedom. That way you end up with the 40 CFD on half space coupled to this 40 theory of gravity living on ADS4. And please keep that in mind because that basic idea that you can go from the intermediate picture to this full BCFT picture by dualizing only the boundary, that will be one of the key concepts I want to go after later. The graviton that you get on this ADS4 brain is massive. That's not a story I want to tell today. I gave way too many talks about this already. Um, the mass can be understood in all three dual frames. But uh, one thing I want to point out is there's something very special about the near critical limit. If you take the tension of this brain near this critical value where it goes from ADS4 to Minkowski, the brain gets pushed against the boundary. And that's the limit in which the graviton mass goes to zero. It's also a limit in which Newton's constant goes to zero. So it's a very special limit. Um, so that the brain becomes in flat space, the graviton goes to zero mass, Newton's constant goes to zero. That's sort of the critical limit and that will show up in various places later in the talk. Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, so what is responsible for the brain to, to place it in this particular in, in particular anglic position, particular okay, that's the tension, right? So the, the angle of the brain is given by the tension. In this Wendell Sandrum toy model, there's one parameter in the action characterizing the brain, it's tension. If the tension is zero, that's basically you're talking about a pro brain, something that doesn't back react at all. But I don't want to do an orbifold across it. That would be something vertically down, just some brain embedded in flat space in ADS5. And as you increase the tension, the brain goes closer and closer to the boundary until it reaches this critical value at which it detaches from the boundary and becomes a Minkowski brain. So the critical value is where the brain would be Minkowski and it doesn't intersect the boundary at all anymore. But as you approach the critical value, the brain gets kind of closer and closer to the boundary. This angle is shallow and shallow. Right. Thanks. Thanks. What I want to talk with you today about is kind of, is this intermediate picture, can we make this precise, right? It's a very strange reality where gravity shows up on both sides. And if you can make it precise, what is the dictionary? 
And the reason this question comes up now is there's actually recently been proposed from the group in Kyoto, so you're hopefully all very familiar with this. What really is the challenge for this idea that there's this intermediate holography? And that there's some very clear problem with causality in this naive applications of this intermediate picture. If you take this intermediate picture seriously, right, we have a universe living on the brain with gravity coupled to a universe without gravity living out in the true boundary of ADS, then you would say the way a signal propagates in this universe, you have some excitation on the brain, the signal has to first travel up to this joint boundary of the two ADS spaces, the two half spaces, and at the joint boundary, it can communicate over to the bars. And then the signal travels in the bars until like, you measure it at some point. Right? So causality, the distance that's relevant for discussions of causality would be this distance along the brain and along the bars. But you can kind of now explicitly compare and wonder, are there shortcuts by going through the bulk? And then one finds, yes, actually, you can connect a point on the brain and a point in the bars by a geodesic in the bulk, and the geodesic in the bulk is shorter. And Mia and Wei worked out an explicit you know, formula for by how much your shortcut. And the important thing is that of the time difference or the difference of the time squared traveling on like boundary plus brain versus just to the bulk is proportional to the stuff on the right here. So I use the annotation, but the important thing is proportional both to the distance traveled on the brain and the distance traveled in the bars. And there's some formula involving the angle of the brain and the way this angle is labeled here is that basically the critical tension, the one where the brain gets pushed against the boundary would be pi over two. So the shortcut goes away in this limit that the brain goes to the critical value, but otherwise for generic angles, for generic brain angles, I definitely get a shortcut. I seem to have a clear violation of causality that uh, no, the, tool, the intermediate picture seems to be inconsistent with causality if I have this bulk tool because UD6 to the bulk violate causality in the brain plus pass. A few comments on this, right? So in the critical limit, these shortcuts vanish. Maybe there are some approximately causal description this limit, but no, one might also worry that maybe this intermediate picture was just too naive. It sounded sort of strange to begin with that gravity appears on both sides. Now there seems to be a clear inconsistency. The IPYR dependence means that you can't locally mess around with the description on the brain, just changing, say, maybe the metric on the brain, maybe I got the curvature radius wrong. None of this helps just because you need to do something on the brain which depends not just on the physics of the brain, but also depends on the point in the bars to which you eventually want to send the signals. You'd have to do something sort of question dependent, depending on what correlation function you want to calculate, you have to do different modifications. Maybe most importantly, there's no causality problems when you calculate both insertions on the brain or both insertions on the boundary. In particular, the BCFD tool is perfectly causal. If you calculate any correlation function that has both insertions up on the true boundary, which you would do for the BCFD, you never run into any problems with causality. These problems with causality, they are completely uh, you know, localized to this intermediate picture. The BCFD picture is perfectly fine. So what to do, right? Um, when the Sundrum brains, as I introduced them so far, they aren't part of string theory. So maybe none of this makes sense, right? All the brains we know of in string theory, they are different from these RS brains, even the low energy limit. In that they source other fields besides just the metric. Usually, you know, the supersymmetric B brains source Ramon Ramon gauge fields. All these, you know, even the non supersymmetric B brains source the Dilaton one way or another. You always end up with a situation where the metric isn't ADS5 away from the brain, where the brain actually distorts the space time everywhere. And therefore, these random Sundum toy models may just not be accurate. Right? So you might ask yourself, what does this story look like, the story of intermediate holography, if you work with the UV, UV complete description of like some ADS BCFT picture? For example, in the case of the critical brain, right, these random sundown brains, they always stand in for something more complicated. Like a UV brain, the thing that I described so far, where you cut out the UV part of space time, there's some paper by Verlinde where he tells you that's really some sort of you know, toy model description of what's eventually an F series compactification. An IR brain, which would be like a negative tension brain, which removes the other half of space time, that can be modeled sort of as a model of a Kleban of Strassler cascading throats. But the full string theory geometries are always slightly different. They share some qualitative features with RS brains, but RS brains, as they stand, we don't know how to get off a consistent theory of quantum gravity. So maybe there's just something wrong with the brains. So how do I get a top-down version of a BCFT? This has been you know, determined in great detail by the UCLA group. You know, the first paper on this was by Doka, Estes, and Kutperle, but they've written many more papers on this. 
let me just walk you through the step by step of um, how you get a solution like this. So if you want to have a holographic top-down model, you should start with your favorite holographic CFT, say no n equals four super young mills. That's always a good starting point if you can realize on a stack of these three things. So now we want to make a boundary CFT. So we need to take n equals four super young mills and somehow put it on half space. And so we need to kind of put some boundary conditions, have a stack of these, a half stack of these three brains, where these three brains end on something. Ideally, we want to do this in the super symmetric way, so we have some control. So the easiest way to have these three brains end is to have them end on NS5 brain or D5 brain. And that will give me Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions for some of the fields. A different half is Dirichlet and Neumann, depending whether it's NS5 or D5. That almost gets you there, but it still has a small problem. If you do this, there's basically no boundary degrees of freedom. You have kind of a large central charge in the bulk, at least if you have like no n equals four to young mills with a large n, then you have um, no, a, a large central charge in the 40 part of space. But this 3D boundary theory is really a small central charge theory, and you wouldn't expect this to be a holographic tool. We have a fighting chance of having a good BCFT tool. We only have a large number of degrees of freedom, both in 4D and in 3D. The way to remedy this is to not just simply add end on like a single endless brain or the five brain, but to act on some complicated stack of brains. This is what I've depicted here. So you have this semi-infinity three brains giving me n equals four to n minutes on half space. And then what I'm ending on is some sort of sandwich of endless brains and the five brains themselves connected by snippets of these three brains. So all, all the, everything in my picture that's kind of to the left of the semi-infinity three brains that really gets kind of pushed down to the point these are like NS5 brains and D5 brains and D3 brains all sitting on top of each other. The reason I drew them sort of pulled apart is that so you see what's really going on. The claim is if I take lots and lots of those brains, then I get a 3D CFD with a large central charge to a large number of degrees of freedom, both in the 3D CFD and the 4D CFD on half space. The 4D CFD on half space, this is a complicated boundary condition, which is itself a, central, uh, no, a 3D CFD with a large number of degrees of freedom. These pictures have been first, first drawn by Hanani and Witten a long time ago. And then Gayotto and Witten basically gave a complete classification of these um, CFTs that we can get this way. And you can independently dial the 3D and 4D central charge depending on kind of how many semi infinite C brains you take and by how complicated the sandwich is. In particular, the gauge group we're going to study. So there are some um, constraints on how many C brains have to be sitting between these various NS5 brains. There's some notion that like all these gauge groups that are gonna appear in the 3D CFT, they have to be rebalanced. That's some sort of condition that I get a genuine 3D CFT. There's no extra stuff and you know, everything nicely flows to like a CFT in the IR. This uh, gauge theory that I get in 3D is gonna be characterized by two numbers, N5 and K that I can independently dial. And then you get sort of a, 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 one of these quiver gauge theories where I have like many, many gauge groups of increasing rank they have bi-fundamental matter that connects two neighboring gauge groups to each other. I chose to put all my fundamental matter that I have in addition into the central gauge group. That's the biggest one that you get sort of smaller and smaller again. And then the important thing is that 3D CFT has some global U2N5K symmetry. And I call this particular combination of N5 and K, I call N. So N is no independent parameter, it's just com some combination of N and 5K. And that what appears as a global symmetry from the 3D CFT becomes the gauge group of the n equals 4 super young mills. So the 3D CFT is coupled to the 4D super young mills by having a large global symmetry, which is gauged by the n equals 4 gauge. This picture that I draw here is when n5 is bigger than 2k. Uh, when n5 is less than, than 2k, then the 3D global symmetry is only a subgroup of the 4D gauge group. And there's some partial directly boundary conditions. We have a discussion of this in our paper too, but I don't want to consider this case in today's talk. So the 3D CFT by itself would have some SEN global symmetry. The n equals four zero mills in half space has Neumann boundary conditions. So we choose Neumann boundary conditions for the gauge field. So I have an SEN gauge symmetry and the way the two are coupled to each other is that the global symmetry of the 3D CFT is gauged by the 4D gauge field. Here's how this looks like in formulas, right? I can define the 3D partition function as always. This is some strongly coupled 3D CFT. It has some SEN gauge group, uh, SEN global symmetry. So I can introduce a background gauge field A for this SEN global symmetry and calculate the 3D partition function as a function of this background gauge field. And the way we get the 4D BCFT that way is you basically take the 3D partition function 
And then we post process it with like the action of any program with and like integrate over this gauge field. So what used to be a background gauge field for a global symmetry from the 3D point of view becomes the dynamical gauge field of the coordinates. And I can also draw pictures of what I just did, right? My full PCFD has the semi infinity three brains sticking out of the sandwich of NS5 brains, D5 brains, and D3 brains. If I want to define this 3D CFD on its own, what I could do is I take this last, you know, these three brains that come out of my sandwich and end them on D5 brains. This way I get a purely 3D CFD with this SEN global symmetry. And you can think of this process of gauging the 4D. Theory coupling to 40 super young wheels via gauging is just taking these D5 frames and sending them off to infinity. So I can start with the 3D CFD with this global symmetry, get the B CFD by coupled to the dynamical Enkels voltage field. Can we find the super gravity dual for this? Let me first tell you why this is actually hard. Right? And this you can simply see by symmetry. Often in ADS CFD, the bulk dual is more or less determined by symmetry alone. Sometimes you have to solve an ODE. So what do we have here? We have a, a 4D 3D BCFT, so a 4D CFT on half space coupled to a 3D CFT. So the symmetry of this is the same as the isometry of ADS4, right? The 3D CFT drives the symmetry of this. We have a supersymmetric series that has a huge R symmetry, but the R symmetry in this case is no longer SO6, but the SO6 of N equals 14 young wheels gets broken down to SU2 times SU2. And the way the spin is transformed, it's basically telling you that the bulk, you have two S2 factors. Now you can do a simple counting exercise and see that you're kind of in bad shape. Four plus two plus two makes eight. So symmetry gives me like eight dimensions of my 10D space time are fixed, but that's telling me I have two dimensions left. I can call them a Riemann surface sigma. But the problem now is that unlike what we often see in holography where you solve everything as a function of one variable, now I really have to solve PDEs. All my metric functions, the flux fields, the diloton, the axion, every field inside and type to be supergravity depends on two variables, the two coordinates, U and V, or however you want to call them, on the Riemann surface sigma. So even so, you have supersymmetry in the end, you only solve first order equations. You have to solve nonlinear PDEs and two variables. You might think that's impossible, but it's not really if you're you know, trained enough in doing that. So it's like almost a miracle that people could do this, but Doka Estes and Good Parallel came up with the complete solution for any bulk geometry, which looks like A is four times as two times as two as times sigma, which preserves after the supersymmetry. So all solutions with the symmetry have been identified. You can write on the full solution explicitly in terms of some sort of harmonic function. And then the details of exactly what quiver you want to describe, what sandwich of NS5 frames, D5 frames, and D3 frames you're after, that gets all encoded in this one harmonic function. So they didn't just write down one solution, they wrote down a large class of solutions. For now, we're interested in one particular one, the one that corresponds to this n equals four and a half space that I described to you before. This is roughly how the solution looks like. Right? Um, I have the sigma takes the form of a strip. And if you look at this, there's a 40 part of this where the metric becomes more and more the, you know, identical to the metric of ADS5. And in particular, I get sort of half of the original ADS5 boundary back. But if I go in the other way on the strip sigma, there's no brain on which the strip ends. But what's happening is the internal space shrinks to zero size. The space time sort of ends because the internal space um, you no know, vanishes, so my space time just ceases to exist. There are some singularities on the boundary of the strip, and these singularities on the boundary of the strip, they encode sources. They have to be N5 D5 friends and N5 NS5 friends around. You no, know, um, so supergravity breaks down near those sources, but we know exactly what's happening there. We have just a standard brain description of the source sitting there. If you want to compare this to this sort of naive bottom-up model, basically this 4D region is sort of this right-hand size, the part of space-time that I keep, including like half of the boundary of the original ADS5, and then this left part of space-time where everything collapses to a point that's sort of this little wedge that we know. In particular, the boundary of sigma is not the boundary of ADS5. I'm confused. It's the boundary of ADS5 sitting way far to the right in this 4D region. There's no sharply localized rain, right? This red line where my intermediate dual lift on that doesn't exist. Instead, there's some sort of region, some entire extended region, which corresponds to sort of this region of where space-time sort of seems to stop. And if you look at the full set of bulk fields that I have to include, of course, this is a type 2B supergravity solution. But on top of this, I have to include explicitly 
the fields that are living on these brain sources, the NS5 brains and E5 brains living on ADS4 times S2. So I have type 2 these super gravity, and I also have SUN5 times SUN5 gauge fields living on the NS5 brains. Okay. Um, so now you might want to wonder, okay, this, this already makes this intermediate picture sort of much more subtle to define, right? Where's this intermediate series supposed to live, right? Somewhere in here, there should be some ADS4 in which there's a CFT and gravity living, right? So you could kind of basically pick any point in this 3D region and maybe say that's the theory on the brain, or maybe I should use some sort of average. One problem is that none of those resolves the Omiya and Bay causality problem, right? It's pretty much doesn't matter which particular point you choose, whether you choose some sort of average, as long as you take any sort of property that involves this 3D region and want to say that's where my intermediate duality lives, I always going to get the same causality problem again that's due to the fact that my shortcut is dual, you know, it's proportional to the distance I travel in the past, and no matter what I do in the 3D region, that doesn't know about you know, what question you're eventually going to ask. So this intermediate picture is usually presented has serious problems in the sense that there's a genuine causality issue that just won't go away, even full string so it doesn't make it go away. So, so where to go from this, right? There's a lot at stake with the intermediate picture. Some of us have built a good fraction of our career around this, so it better be true. Also, when you care about page curves and islands, and if you want to look in more than one plus one dimensions, all sort of proposals where people have explicitly found these page curves, by right? explicitly being able to calculate them, you rely on these sort of Wendel Sundin brains and this intermediate picture duality, um, including like this paper by Christoph Uhlemann, where he basically used this top down model and found islands and page curves and like a genuine you know, quantum sphere of gravity that can be embedded in full fledged swing theory. But there was always this idea that I have the intermediate description, which allows me to interpret these calculations in terms of like properties of a black hole. And if one calls this into question, then um, no. That would be really sad. Fortunately, I think we can do better. What I want to describe to you in the rest of my talk is if we can actually use this top-down model to give a first principles derivation of a better intermediate picture, a picture that actually works. And that will directly follow from ADSCFT applied to this UCL solution. By construction, it avoids all causality problems, but it's genuinely different from the naive intermediate picture where you have a graviton living on the brain. It's definitely more complicated and it's a genuinely different geometry that you have. So how are we going to do this? And I, I promise you, you should keep this picture in mind. So let's go back to how in this naive bottom-up picture we related sort of the true BCFT tool and this sort of intermediate picture. Right, right? in this top-down model, this BCFT, that's definitely well-defined, right? I can write down what this BCFT is. N equals 40 on Milton half space coupled to the sandwich of NS5 brains, D5 brains, D3 brains. The BCFT is definitely fine, right? And the full bulk tool is also fine, right? The UCL people wrote down the solution. It's a perfectly fine graphics. What we want to somehow define is this intermediate picture. And what we're going to do is so we're going to do explicitly what I before told you, sort of the spirit of this intermediate tool. I'm going to start with the BCFT and I'm going to use holography only on the 3D degrees of freedom, but leave the 40 degrees of freedom untouched. So we're going to define the intermediate picture as what you get when you start with the well-defined BCFT and only do lives the 3D degrees of freedom. I can write this down in formulas and in pictures at what I want to do before. Right? I know exactly what this 3D CFT alone looks like in terms of brain pictures. Again, I take the same brain setup that I use for the full BCFT, but I introduce this extra D5 brains and D5 brains on which these, these three brains can end. And this way you get a brain picture for the 3D CFT without coupling it to any Kisforsium mills. I want to dualize this. And after I use holography for the 3D CFT, by hand, we couple it to the n equals four gauge fields. This way, we'll define a proper intermediate picture. What we've done before we dualize the full BCFT geometry, this time we're only going to dualize the 3D CFT. Okay. This is the slide I had before. The 3D CFT has an SEM global symmetry. I have some background gauge fields. What I'm going to basically do here is I take the 3D partition function and have some zero and ADS4 that holographically calculates the 3D partition function for me. So I'm only going to use holography to calculate the 3D partition function. And then I define the full BCFD partition function by taking this output of the holographic calculation and by hand coupling it to the n equals 4 to the unmill station. So in the old, BC, old holographic tool, we immediately constructed the full holographic tool for the full 4D BCFD partition function. 
This time we only take this little bit and piece out of the BCFD partition function, the 3D piece, and we only do lies in the 3D piece. This way of thinking about intermediate holography automatically comes with several advantages, right? Um, and that's sort of something about when you should use which tool, right? The 3D CFT is intrinsically strongly coupled. The fact that you had to squish all these brains on top of each other is kind of trying to capture the idea that in 3D, you know, the gauge coupling flows to strong coupling in the infrared. And uh, you no, know, it basically I'm working at infinite coupling from the 3D point of view. These are intrinsically strongly coupled 3D CFTs. So it's always a good idea to holographically describe the 3D CFT, if you do anyway. But NXS for surround mills itself has a coupling constant that's sort of a free parameter. If n equals four surround mills is strongly coupled, you should use this full BCFT tool. You have everything strongly coupled. You want to use one holographic tool, which immediately dualizes the entire BCFT, n equals four, and the 3D CFT. Whereas when n equals four is weakly coupled, then you want to do this intermediate stuff where you only use holography on the 3D CFT, and then you can use perturbation theory to weakly couple it to n equals four. Of course, all three tools are always valid, but only when n equals four is weakly coupled is the intermediate picture useful. When n equals four is strongly coupled, the full BCFD tool is useful. So to do this holographically, to do like top-down intermediate dual, what we need is the geometry that's dual to the 3D CFD terminated on D5 frames rather than the holographic dual for the full BCFD that we've been using so far. And no, fortunately enough, the same UCLA paper had every possible solution with this symmetry in there, so it also has the one we're looking for. So what's different this time, right? I can write down the strip sigma, and it has these various regions. So one thing that changes is that where we used to have this asymptotic ADS5 region, this time the internal space shrinks to zero also to the right in this picture. So my you know, internal space collapses on both ends. So I have no more asymptotic ADS5 direction. Really, this geometry in run now looks much more like a standard compactification to warp compactification, but essentially I have ADS5 times a compact space. I have some sort of deformed S5 and a finite size interval. My entire 60 space is compact. I just get ADS5 times something compact. The other new thing is I have more brain sources. Before I had N5 D5 brains and NS5 brains. Now I get an extra N D5 brains because I introduced them in my field theory in order to terminate these, these three brains on. To get this SUN global symmetry, I had to introduce an extra ND5 brains in the body. So the type to be, uh, the, the bulk description involves type to be supergravity, and again, gauge fields on ADS four times S2, but I get an extra SUN gauge group living on ADS four times S2, and you see that's exactly the same as the N equals four gauge group. So we get the picture where indeed in the bulk, I have the same gauge theory living in the bulk as I had out in the boundary. That sort of was a crucial part of this bottom up RS pictures. The same CFT is also living on the brain. We see this popping up here like this. There's this SUN gauge group now living also in the bulk. If you want to think of it like a top, a bottom up version of this, basically what's happened if I just want to describe this 3D CFT, you do something that also was found in Kyoto, which you now you call retrolography, where you basically introduce the second brain, this, you know, Going from the BCFT to just the 3D CFT is like introducing a second brain. Now in the bulk, you have like a finite size wedge. That's why my bulk is no longer sort of something that's asymptotically ADS5, but it's really just ADS4 times some interval and some sort of warp. And this you no know, solution that we just described, coupled to the dynamical boundary gauge field by hand, has all the properties we want from some intermediate tool, right? The, the theory that we just described has 40 gravity on ADS form times some compact internal space. And it's coupled to N equals four super mills on half space on this path. And we did this coupling sort of basically by hand post-processing. We use holography to only calculate the 3D CFT partition function that gave us 40 gravity on ADS form. And then we coupled by hand to N equals four super mills on the path. It's well known that the moment you do this, the graviton will get a mass from this coupling to the path. This is sort of Parati's calculation. So the graviton will get its mass just the same as before via this coupling to the path. On ADS4, we have the same maximal supersymmetric down mills group from these extra five brains we had to add. So this is pretty much everything that we wanted to see from bottom up holography. The one thing we're not seeing is that the CFT is actually cut off, but that's just as well. None of these calculations that people did with this intermediate picture, they seriously took the cutoff into account. Um, here, we don't seem to need it. This intermediate picture is just 
you know, it's a UV complete description of the system. I guess UV completed by strings here, but I don't see some sort of explicit map. Um, now you might wonder, so how much does this change the story, right? So what people have been using so far is what I would call the full BCFT geometry. And they said the intermediate picture somehow lives on that brain. Right? What I'm telling you instead, what you should be thinking, the real intermediate geometry is you have that sort of wedge, that wedge is sort of the physics of the brain. And then you couple this by hand to any source to run mills. This is what you should think of the intermediate picture. So is there any sense in which maybe the geometry at least near this brain or near the point where space time ends, maybe this geometry is similar and I'm not making a big mistake by sort of having the intermediate picture live in the full BCFT geometry. Right? So that's the real difference. In the old ways people kind of saw the intermediate picture lives in this full BCFT geometry. What I'm telling you right now is the intermediate picture is a genuinely different geometry. There are two geometries. There's the full BCFT geometry, which really is only there to calculate quantities in the full BCFT. There's this intermediate picture geometry, which is the dual to the 3D CFT, which you then have to by hand couple the any source you have. And you might ask yourself, is there some sense in which like maybe near the end point of space time, these two geometries look the same? Right. So what we're going to do is we compare the metrics of the, these two solutions deep in the 3D region. So towards the end where the space time, the internal space collapses. You know, there, there are lots of functions that you could plot. We, we picked a bunch of them, like the Ritchie scalar and string frame, Einstein frame, the 84 radius and Einstein frame and string frame. We plot this as a function of this k over n5, right? There were two parameters here. Both k and n5 should be large so that they have a semi-classical description, but the ratio is a three parameter. And no one is what I would be looking for for this ratio if I wanted to say these two geometries are actually the same. And then you see that for generic values of k over n5, these geometries look nothing, nothing alike. Right? Even near the brain, even near the point where space time ends, these two geometries are genuinely different. Only in the limit where k over n5 goes to zero do I get the fact that these two geometries approximate each other. What is this interesting region? So k over n5, if you translate this back to bottom-up language, this is exactly the near critical limit. This is the limit where in the corresponding bottom-up model the brain gets pushed against the boundary. Now, from the top-down point of view, we can also know, give this a different name. That's basically a limit in which the number of 3D degrees of freedom is much larger than the number of 4D degrees of freedom. Both independently have to be large to have any hope of a holographic description, but you can go to this limit where the 3D degrees of freedom are much bigger than the 4D degrees of freedom. In that limit, the brain gets pushed against the boundary, but this is also the limit in which there were never any problems to begin with, right? That's where the shortcuts disappear, the graviton goes massless, Newton's constant goes to zero. There's also sort of a proposal by Neuenfeld that supposedly for this dictionary for bottom up holography, which worked exactly in this limit. So I think there's some hope that maybe in this near critical limit, there's some nicer way of doing this. And even that near critical limit, you know, our description basically boils down to the standard description. But the advantage of our description is it always works, and I don't have to worry about whether these shortcuts, like to what order in the small parameter do I have to work? Our description just works always. And it's when I'm mildly away from the near critical limit, I just get a genuinely different geometry. I'm no longer using the BCFT geometry, I'm using a genuinely different geometry. Um, right, so the, the shortcuts appear at leading order in the small parameter, and I'm not quite sure how you would organize things exactly in this k of n5 goes to zero limit. Maybe we can do something there, but I, I'm no longer super interested in this because I think we can do better. We can just define the intermediate picture as I did today, and then you never have to worry about shortcuts. Everything's manifested in this. What I want to spend my last few minutes on is kind of ask myself what implications this sort of what I would claim is a new insight how intermediate holography really works for these ideas of using our S frames to calculate islands. So I'm not going to explain this whole picture, but the basic spirit here is if you have this intermediate picture, I can sort of put a black hole on this intermediate picture, and then I can kind of try to calculate the entropy of radiation that came out of that black hole. I do this by identifying some region out in the sparse as saying, well, once degrees of freedom made it out all the way to the bars, they surely have escaped the black hole. So by calculating the entanglement entropy of this region out in the bars, I can calculate the entanglement entropy of stuff that came out of the black hole. And then I can use what I would call now the full BCFT tool. So this full 5D geometry 
listed vein, use standard classical RT formulas to calculate the entanglement entropy. And then I see sometimes an island shows up and I get page curves and everything is kind of nice and dandy. But this seems to be against the spirit of what I just told you today, right? Because this seems to be exactly trying to make use of the fact that you draw this picture of the brain embedded in the bulk and try to interpret you know, this black hole on the brain directly in terms of the intermediate picture gravity living on the brain. And what I try to tell you today is you shouldn't do this anymore. So are these island calculations in trouble? They're not, and there's some magic going on here, which is really like a cheat, right? But basically all you need is for the intermediate picture to exist, right? You start with a black hole coupled to a bath and the proper intermediate geometry. And now we know how to do this. You take this sort of wedge tool or like, you know, the, the tool only to the 3D CFD, you put a black hole in there and you just say, wouldn't it be nice if I could calculate entanglement entropies for this black hole using some quantum extremal surface description and stuff. And, and you go ahead and say, I have a tool for this. I can translate statements about radiation in this picture in terms of a, BC, a, BC, a field theory calculation in the BSCFT, right? Where I said, use the same words as before, the radiation escaping the black hole makes it this radiation region deep inside the bath. So all I really want to do is calculate the entanglement entropy of the radiation region in the dual BCFT. Then you say, oh, now I have a field theory question. Somebody handed me a field theory question in the BCFT and says, wouldn't it be nice if in this BCFT you could calculate this entanglement entropy of the radiation region because I believe that has something to do with the black hole in this intermediate picture. And then you go ahead and say, well, now you gave me a field theory question. I know how to answer this. I answer this field theory question by calculating Rutaki and Nagi surfaces in the full BCFT geometry. So the black hole lives in a different geometry than the one where you're doing the calculations in. But in the end, you answer the field theory question, and it doesn't matter which geometry you use to calculate it. So at some level, the intermediate picture geometry was only there to motivate why this particular EE is an interesting question. And the full BCFT calculation then was used in order to get the right entanglement entropy. And whatever you find for the time evolution of the entanglement entropy is the right answer. You can call it a page curve from the intermediate point of view. You wouldn't call it a page curve from the BCFT point of view, but who cares? It's the same curve in any case. Um, this is true for everything that has a BCFT interpretation, like the entanglement entropy itself. But no, it is in some level achieved because what you're losing, you're losing the direct geometric interpretation of everything you see in the bulk. So for example, there's one geometric feature of this RT surface that people made a big deal about. If you look at this RT surface that gives me the entanglement island, it seems to tell you that the island in these brain worlds actually extends outside the horizon. And that I'm not sure how interesting this is, but no, at least there was some sort of, who look, the island extends outside the horizon. I'm no longer sure we should take this seriously because this fact that the island extends outside the horizon, that's something you see in this BCFT tool, which is not the description in which you have a 4D gravity coupled to a black hole. When you want to see a 4D graviton coupled to a black hole living in 4D, you should use the intermediate picture. And in the intermediate picture, nobody has seen the island over there. We've seen the island in this roundabout way in the full BCFT geometry. That's not the right holographic rule. So I, I, I don't know. It's not clear. The calculations that have been done right now, I think, do give the correct page curves for this scenario. But again, you shouldn't look at the detailed bulk geometric features and try to directly interpret them in terms of a 4D theory of gravity with a 4D black hole. That lives in a different rule. Hey, um, I was told I should be done in 45 minutes. So I have 15 minutes for questions. I think I did this perfectly fine. So I think what I wanted to show you today is that we can use top-down holography to derive a correct version of double holography. Um, it's different from what the people, people means me, me and others, but not including me. But it, it doesn't agree with what we've been doing for the last 20 years. But uh, I think it's, it's right. It's, um, and what <laughs> the naive picture wasn't quite right. It's the naive picture seemingly needs to be modified, but some of the key results about black holes survive. So hopefully it's not a big deal, but I think it's always better to do things correctly. And at least this intermediate picture reality can actually sort of derive from first principles rather than kind of having to wave your hand and hope for the best. All right, thank you very much for your talk. And now the session is over for discussions. Any questions or comments? Yeah, please speak out. So can I ask a question, Andreas? Yes. 
Yes, of course. So, so can we define some? I, I think in ATSB shift is an angle of this end of the word range is quite important. Do you think that this angle can be different? I mean, there are some counterpart of this angle in it's this. This uh, k over so a... I mean, more super gravity solution. It's this ratio, right? So the this quiver gauge so it has two parameters, k and n, n five. Um, n five is the number of d five rings in k, sort of roughly how much the number of three brains jumps from one gauge group to the other. But there are two parameters, and it's this ratio k over n five that becomes the critical angle. So you can directly see this, right? What what defines the angle in terms of geometric pro properties is the curvature radius of the ADS four in the brain, right? And that you can also see in this. Um, Top down construction so that k over n5 is directly related to the brain angle and uh, sort of it measures the ratio of 3d central charge to 4d central charge and like large k over n5 pushes me against the boundary i get to the near critical limit if i go the other direction i go to the 90 degree angle and for many like for the islands there was the story if you do bottom up there's a critical angle where you go from like the island dominating already you know for large angles in our language, no, whether it's large or small, it depends whether you measure to the middle or to the boundary. But if the brain is kind of near the tensionless limit, deep inside the bulk, very steep angle to the boundary, you get that the island dominates from the very beginning, whereas only for shallow angles, you have the story where first hartmann malder sena wins, you get a linear rise, and then the island dominates. There's a critical angle in between. You see that same phenomena also in the top-down constructions. There's even an analog of the critical angle. So it's it's almost one-to-one, -one, right? It's not quantitatively, but qualitatively, there's a very clear map between this parameter k over n5 and the angle. I see, thank you very much. Yeah, that's very clear. Other questions or comments? Maybe. Hi. Um, All right. That's a question. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, thanks for your wonderful talk. Uh, I think one conclusion of your results is that um, we cannot naively identify uh, the uh, the geometry of the gravity region in the proper intermediate picture uh, with that uh, in the uh, BCFT dual. Um, right. So, I would think yeah. these are two different geometries and you shouldn't identify them. They shouldn't kind of look at the full BCFT dual and say, oh, that region near the brain, that's where my intermediate picture is. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so my question is that uh, we know that in the BCFT drill we have an atom structure on the on the brain. Uh, like, do you think this atom structure still exists uh, in the like um, gravity region in the proper uh, intermediate picture or not? Uh, like, is 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 it just shifted or it it disappears? I'm not sure. Um, that, that's interesting to analyze. Uh, no, I, I, all the geometries are written down explicitly, uh, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, about that particular question. I see. Thanks a lot. Any other questions or comments? Actually, there is one question in the in chat from Rahi, uh, and it is asking: Are there any observational evidence for this solution? And that's not what this is about, right? This is, um, I mean, people study BCFTs, so they're interesting, and this is a calculation tool to calculate properties of BCFTs. Uh, I would think, you no, know, people measured BCFTs in laboratories by studying like interfaces and Ising models, or studying Ising models with the boundary, but um, different BCFTs. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you're only using the geometry as a tool to study field series. Right. Any other questions or comments? So maybe I am confusing, but uh, in the geometry in the geometry for the intermediate picture you introduced, do you have a degree of freedom corresponding to the radion between which corresponds to the scalar field between two brains? I mean, which choreography setup should be probably not a massless one, that they're all massive. I mean, that's sort of now you're you're asking a complicated question, right? So this maybe this yeah. been worked out by uh by the UCLA group, but that's a background solution. Now you're asking, what about small fluctuations around that solution? That is not easy to do. There's Costas okay. studied small fluctuations, but he's mostly been interested in the transverse traceless graviton sector. Because so there was a question, do you get a massive or a massless graviton? Right? And then I think the statement is in the full BCFT tool, you get a massive one, and the wedge you get a massless one. But I, I don't think anybody has worked out the scalar fluctuations. Okay. I would expect there to be a radion, but no, I, I don't think that but this is not, 
not a super trivial calculation, the full top-down tool, right? Because you have a very complicated geometry and you want to ask yourself about linearized fluctuations around that. It's fairly defined, well posed, but uh, not trivial. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Well, I'm just, can I ask okay. one more question? Do you think, uh, I mean, if we think this ADS3 case, do you think something special appears? Because the ADS3 case is, looks like more controllable compared with higher. So you mean like an, an ADS2 brain in ADS3? Yes, 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 exactly. Uh, okay, I'm, no, they are top, think top of that too. Uh, they, they are more complicated, uh, but no, one could, Maybe no. There's so, so I would not. There's even a paper that I wrote with like you no know, Sushi Luo and uh, Hao Yu Sun, where we kind of claim that in ADS3, if you take sort of Maloney and Co. proposal that the Ising model is dual to pure gravity at you no know, a particular value of the ADS curvature radius, if you take that seriously, mm -hmm. then you do the Ising model with boundaries, then it seems to be the case that all you need is a brain with tension. So this is sort of it might well be that in 3D you can make sense of RS brains as they stand. And uh, then you wouldn't have to worry about like intermediate geometry versus mm -hmm. uh, uh, no full top, no the BCFT geometry. It might well be that in 3D one can make more sense out of things. I think in top down models, I would assume the same story as what we see in the higher dimension works. But maybe these bottom up models might actually make sense in 3D, whereas they surely make sense in higher D. Yeah, you tell me. I mean, that I, I'm torn on that. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but it, it, it's, it sounds reasonable. It might happen that in 3D one can actually. I see, I see, I see. So, because of the three, 3D, we have this boundary entropy, which is related to tension, as uh, you know. So, do you right. think we can get some, uh, I mean, constraint of boundary entropy from this top down approach? I mean, you would get explicit values, right? It's, 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 I think from the top-down point of view, there's much more to the brain, right? You have this NS5 brain sandwich. In higher dimensions, you can also define an analog of the boundary. Mm. It's, it's not a number, but you can calculate sort of like free energies or something like this. You can definitely calculate quantity of effect if you calculate the number of degrees of freedom in 3D, like you know, the free energy on a sphere or something like this. And so that's, that's one number, whereas these, these brain sandwiches, you can calculate that number, but you can also calculate more. So I would think, at least in the higher dimensional examples, the tent captures like one aspect of the full top-down construction. The full top-down construction has more details about the 3D boundary conditions. Right? The 3D boundary conditions, there's a lot of data that's in there. One piece of data is just how many degrees of freedom there are. That's sort of what the tension knows about. The full top-down model knows about more. I, I would, if you do top-down in ADS3, you find the same, that the full top-down data, but one piece of data is mm. calculated in USP. The bottom up model kind of is a stand in which gets key right, but then doesn't know about the rest. So, so, so you are top down mod, you, the top down model you discussed for AD, ADS5, I think, with ADS4 brain. Yeah. And that's yeah. the angle is arbitrary, basically. So, angle so that, of this brain. The K of N5 controls yeah. the angle. Yes, it's, uh, it's because it, I can make the same, I can dial the 3D charge by basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah number of NS5 frames, so I can independently dial the 3D I charge. see, I see, I see, I see. So it's kind of no, no bound in, in that sense. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's very interesting. All right. Maybe it's high time to close this session. And because that's shall we thank the speaker again. Thank you.